uh, a candidate for um, the pastor position here. Um, and it was, uh, we spent the morning together. It was just a great time of fellowship. He had applied last year and then um, out of another sort of commitment that he had in his own locality to, um, to see if they were supposed to start a church there. Um, he, he stepped back from us in order to pursue that. Uh, that hadn't um, worked out for him. And so he recently was contacted by our elder Chuck Cromer, who the very day that Chuck emailed him, he was sitting down to email us to say that uh, would we perhaps consider him again. His name is Dennis Hobbs, a uh, young man with a young family. Uh, they live in Mexico, Missouri, and um, uh, the um, pulpit committee uh, convened again this past week. Uh, coming up, the elders in the pulpit committee will do another uh, interview with him, and then we will have him here uh, on a Sunday morning, November the 24th, uh, so that the congregation can hear him minister the word, and um, we'll probably have some sort of um, fellowship gathering afterwards for any of you and all of you to, uh, to get to know him and to uh, ask questions or whatever. So the process is moving along. We're excited about that. Uh, and there are perhaps some other things that will be moving along as well. So it seems like all of a sudden the Lord has uh, thought that, that this particular time be a time for us to, uh, to have some people to consider. So just be in prayer for that. It's exciting. It's uh, obviously an answer to prayer so far. But we want to be sure that uh, uh, we have the discernment of the Holy Spirit so that um, we can actually move from generation to generation. Uh, certainly, your just enormous generosity in that campaign we did during the summer has placed us in a financial position where we can now move and operate in this thing in a way with, with faith and assurance that uh, we can go forward. So uh, thank the Lord for all of that as well. So be praying. We're excited, okay? Also, uh, annually, uh, we honor uh, Gary Varner. He was a elder here at West Springs Church. Um, before he passed away some uh, 13, 14 years ago now, and um, uh, meant so much to this body, meant so much to me personally, uh, just contributed of his life and his heart in, in such a foundational way to this church. And so we determined uh, years ago that we would honor him every year by doing what we know, what we call the Gary Varner Street Level Theology Series. That will happen on November 17th. We have a young man, Tim Montgomery, uh, who uh, knows Gary, worked with uh, Gary and Carol uh, on trips to Russia, uh, and he is going to come and bring the word to us as we celebrate that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> come back, boys, there it is, uh, that particular Sunday. So, um, again, something to look forward to. We'll get you more information about that uh, in the coming weeks, okay? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is not only available to us, but when we approach you in your word, you are there. By your spirit, you speak into our lives, our hearts. We don't do historical study here. We deal with you living and active in your word, by your spirit, changing us, comforting us, encouraging us, directing us, correcting us, and revealing yourself to us deeper and deeper still. I pray this will happen to us this morning as we meet around your word now. In the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 1. Oh, look at this, thank you. Psalm 1, that's right before Psalm 2. <laughs> that's helpful. <clears throat> We're just going to read the first three verses. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight 
is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. As we prayed in advance, Lord, let this word work in us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would, would you indulge me for a bit this morning? I want you to do something. I want you to close your eyes, listen to what I say, and then do what I say, okay? Close your eyes, listen to what I say, and then do what I say. All right, everybody? Eyes closed, listen to what I say, do what I say. Don't think about monkeys. All right, raise your hands if you obeyed. You didn't think about monkeys. Good for you. Let's try this again. Close your eyes. Do what I say. Don't think about the ace of spades. How many of you didn't think about the ace of spades? Wow, that's really impressive. But for the rest of you, what a gang of rebels you are. <laughs> you know, most of us, we realized in the midst of all that, we didn't stand a chance. It's hard to avoid what is right in front of you. What thought just intrudes. What, what things you seek out. Even more so if they're desirable, if they're longed for, or if something has a hook in you, not to think about those things. Now, keeping that little exercise in mind, I'm sure that you've noticed, any of you who have been around Christianity at all, that the Christian faith has attached to it a certain degree of morality. The Christian faith addresses behavior. It extols good deeds and admonishes those who do wrong. Jesus said, go and sin no more. The Apostle Paul tells us to say no to sin. The Ten Commandments, they have a bunch of thou shall nots. There are over 600 laws in the Old Testament. And one could get the idea that people of faith who are wanting to be faithful must and should expend a lot of energy working on being good and being obedient, being moral. And it wouldn't be illogical of you to come to that conclusion. The lifestyle of faithful, committed Christians ought to be marked by being different than from what we say the rest of the world does. But like monkeys and the ace of spades, we wind up thinking about sin all the time because we're told not to do it. And so it's on our minds. And I want to show you from God's word this morning that admittedly God's word does command against bad behavior and calls for upright living. It provides for us also a way of finding life that we're called to live. Being able to say no to sin and yes to godly living, but then also to live life as it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it tells us this. Live such good lives among unbelievers that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We're called to that life, yes, but 
Here's the important part. It is done in a way not based on willpower or conviction or guilt or resolutions. Could we all discover or perhaps rediscover this today? So let's look at our passage. Psalm 1. We'll look at the first verse. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Now it says blessed. The word blessed connotes being happy. It's actually about an emotional state. It connotes being happy, and that's important. What we don't get here, right at the beginning, what we don't get here is a sense of drudgery, of weight-bearing, of slogging through, teeth-gritted exertion here. This is a happy person. But this person, happy, this man or woman, is living out the thou shalt nots. It says they don't walk in step with the wicked. Walk in step translates the word counsel. They don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Counsel is a way of thinking. It's saying they don't walk in the worldview of the rest of the world. They don't adopt the worldview of the unfaithful. Then it goes on and says, neither do they stand in the way of sinners. First they're walking, now they're standing. They haven't devolved from just a way of looking at the world into now identifying as one of them. They stand in there. I'm right in here, I'm identifying. And then they wind up sitting in the company of mockers. This further descending into a commitment of rejection of God's way, and it's marked by derision of God and his followers. They now sit and mock. This is such wise and inspired poetry here in Psalm 1, verse 1. It shows in a, a handful of words the downward trajectory of sin and arrogance while establishing that one is actually happy when they're not moving on that most natural slope downward. You're happy if you're not caught up in all of this. But this is what the world is caught up in. They go from walking to standing to sitting in that life. In the New Testament, the Apostle John is telling us much the same thing. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, he says this to the faithful. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. And he describes it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says the world and its desires pass away. But here's the issue. How? How? How do I say no to sin, to carnal desire, to indulgence in anger, to craving control, to demanding my way on my terms, in my timing? How? Especially when part of me maybe at times a lot of me doesn't even want to say no. Now I'll answer that how with the Word of God in a second. Because the Word of God answers this question how in a way that is clear and resounds with authority and practicality. But let me first tell you about the sirens. In Greek mythology, the sirens appear as winged, 
female beings of great beauty who sang songs so alluring that sailors who passed near the island that they inhabited, these sailors hearing the songs would throw themselves into the sea to be with them. And then soon they discovered that the sirens were carnivorous, feeding upon the flesh of those that they had entrapped. In two classic Greek tales, attempts are made to nullify the inescapable song of the sirens. In Homer's The Odyssey, Odysseus and his crew are returning from the Trojan Wars, and they have to go by the island of the sirens, and so they attempt to escape the sirens in this way. Odysseus has his crew put melted wax in their ears to deafen for them the silence, the siren song. That's what he does for his crew. But Odysseus, he says, I have got to hear the song of the sirens. So he has the crew lash him to the mast of the ship, bind him and tie him to that mast with ropes. And then he forbids them to loosen his bonds no matter how hard he begs. As they pass along the island of the sirens, the song's allure drives him to the brink of madness. But he and his crew survive. Odysseus, you see, flirted with temptation all the way to its deadly edge. He walked in it, he stood in it, and he sat in it. And only his crew kept him from dying in it. This is external restraint with no internal change. Now, external restraint isn't the worst thing. By all means, put filters on your web browser if you're tempted to porn. Avoid the sports bar in the tavern if you have a drinking problem. It's smart to have certain restraints and safeguards in place to keep us from sin. But you can address the behavior and miss your heart entirely. You could learn, you could learn how to control your tongue and still harbor inside all sorts of internal rage. You could get your budget and your finances all in line and still remain dissatisfied and ever longing for bigger and for better and for more. And you can throw your computer out the window and still retain a lustful heart. I said there were two siren stories. Here's the other one. Apollonius of Rhodes tells a story of Jason and the Argonauts. They're in search of this thing called the Golden Fleece. And to find it, they have to sail by the island of the Sirens. But Jason has a much different strategy. Instead of blocking out the siren song, and instead of binding himself to the mast of the ship, Jason has the great musician Orpheus on board. And as their boat, the Argo, approach the island, Jason instructs Orpheus to sit on the bow of the ship and to sing and play. The resulting song was so much more beautiful than the song of the sirens that the crew was entirely unaffected by the threat. Their hearts were captivated by a more beautiful song. Here's the point. The love for this world, the lure to walk in its counsel, to stand in its identity, and to wind up numbered among the scoffing 
cynics. It can't be extinguished by recognizing its worthlessness or even its danger. What's needed, and more importantly for believers, what is provided is another love, a better song from God, who not only calls us away from sin, he calls us to himself through his son, Jesus, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Back to Psalm 1, verse 2, the happy one. We know he does not walk, stand, or sit the way the wicked do. But what do we do? What does it say? Verse 2. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night? Look. Hear this. To delight in the law of the Lord does not mean you go around saying, praise God, I love the Eighth Commandment. Not stealing is my jam. And no cap, I love the Ninth Commandment too. That's not what it's talking about here. I'm not talking about the particular laws here. You see, the term law of the Lord has in view the totality of the law and the totality of the law what it was meant to do well what was it meant to do well first of all the Old Testament book that contains God giving all the particulars of the law to the people the one Old Testament book almost completely devoted to the giving of the law is called the book of Leviticus except it wasn't the Hebrew Bible doesn't call it Leviticus. The Hebrew Bible is taken from the first word in the book of Leviticus, Vayikra, Vayikra, the first word of the book. And you know what it means? And God called. And God called. God's heart intention is to call us sinners and scoffers to himself and the law does make clear what sin is and how it defiles but it does so also for the purpose of revealing to us God's great character because he knows no sin so the law reveals to us also God's great character He'll never lie to you. He'll never misuse or abuse you. He is for life. He exalts in faithfulness. He wants you to rest from your labor and to rest in Him. And you don't need to steal because he delights in providing for you. And he sets the lonely in families. Read the Ten Commandments that way. As how they reveal the great character and heart of our God. Also in the law, moreover, when we do sin, the law tells us that he has made a way for us to get right again. Most of what's in the law isn't about what not to do, although that's there. But it's also about what to do when you did what you're not supposed to do. It's the Old Testament sacrifices. In the Old Testament sacrifices, in the, in the law, an animal or some food could be offered to God as a substitute in your place so that you could escape the carnivorous sirens of sin and live because he has a better and a greater song. The law of the Lord reveals the heart of the Lord, his unassailable character, his majesty that extends to the heavens 
and reaches to you. A heart God has that ultimately substitutes himself as a sacrifice for your sins. Jesus says in John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So where are we here? Keeping faithful to the Lord is not lashing ourselves to the mast, showing some sort of grit and determination. It's casting ourselves into the limitless sea of the love of Jesus and the love of the Father. You have to hear that song calling to you. Not to devour you, like the song of the sirens was for, but to save you and to lead you to life. How do you get the air out of this cup? How do I get the air out of it? How do you get the air out of this cup? Well, I could attach a vacuum device to it, seal it tight, and that vacuum device could remove all the air out of the cup. But if the seal would fail, or the device would fail, as soon as that happened, the air would rush right back in. Or allow too much negative pressure from the vacuum device, and it would crumble or implode. And this is how many of us seek to get the sin out of ourselves. We seal ourselves off, and we use various devices to avoid sin, apply all kinds of negative pressure on ourselves. And then, because that's not enough, we start applying it on fellow believers. We put it on them, too. And then we turn around in derision and put it on the world. But look around. From your own heart to other believers to the world, this only leads to failure. Watch how I get all the air out of this cup. No more air. No more air. No more air. Because I filled it. And this is the God-given way found in the Word of God to expel sin from our lives. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. What does it say? It says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And God told the prophets of old, for example, Ezekiel, that this is what he was going to do. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, hundreds of years before Jesus came. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And Jesus said in John 14, starting in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. 
day by day? How does the Spirit of God expel sin? Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15. Kind of sums all this up for us. Be careful then how you live, okay? We're not casual or unconcerned about sin in our lives. Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Lord, you don't want me to sin. I know that. How do I do that? Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Here it is. Start one place, get drunk, wind up in a worse place, debauchery. Just like we've been talking about. He says, don't do that. Okay? Does that mean don't think about drinking and don't think about debauchery? No, it says, instead... Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Songs from the Spirit. I love this. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's right there. Practical, real, daily how God deals with the resident sin we still struggle with. The point is clear. We can spend our days lashing ourselves to the mast, hearing the siren song of sin and selfishness, and really in our hearts begging to pursue that which leads to death. Or we can throw ourselves into the sea of God's grace and his mercy and his love and his way and his spirit, all purchased for us by the willing sacrifice of Jesus, of his own sinless self on the cross, in our place, so that we can not only hear the call of God, but also hear the better song, the song of the spirit that calls us to be filled again and again and again with the reality and the constancy of God's great love. And we hear again and again and again the words of his better song to come, to be filled, and to be free. Let's have the worship team come up and pray with me.